And welcome to episode 8 of the Bruin Bible. We officially have UCLA football coming this weekend, August 28th. I am so lucky to be joined by LA Football Network's very own Jamal Madney. Jamal, you're in Denver, Colorado right now, is that correct? Yes, I am. And excited to be here with you, Will, and, and talk about the Bruins. Thanks so much for having me. We are stoked to have you, man. And you wrote a fantastic article this past week on the state of the Bruins program and how it's really kind of stumbled since the Terry Donahue era. Um, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the upcoming season as a whole. We got a game against Hawaii this weekend, a lot to be excited about, maybe some predictions there and maybe an over under win total for the Dorian Thompson Robinson slash Chip Kelly led Bruins this year. But let's go to your article first. Great piece. I recommend anyone listening to this to go to the network's website and check it out. Jamal's a really talented writer that we're going to have on the show as much as he would like to come on. Uh, Jamal, kind of give me the background on what has gone wrong since Donahue retired in the late 90s. You know, Will, it's really interesting. When you think about UCLA football, it really feels like a hidden gem program, both nationally as well as on the West Coast. When, when you look at kind of the key ingredients of, of what they have, a, a national brand, a historic brand of, of athletic success, you talk about the academics, you talk about the campus, uh, you talk about the national exposure, name recognition, the co-eds, you know, it, it really doesn't make a lot of sense at first glance as to why UCLA football has struggled the way it has in the past 20 plus years. And I think part of it has been a correlation with the influx of just money in professional sports and professional football in particular. And that's kind of forced athletic programs to really have hyper-focused strategies of whether or not they're a football first school or they're a basketball first school. And I think UCLA has taken the approach of, hey, we want to be kind of an all-around athletic department but I think they've kind of realized that they need to double down a little bit more uh, in terms of football resources. And I think there's been a turning of the corner, A, with the hiring of Chip Kelly and kind of paying him top dollar as opposed to Rick Neuheisel and the Durrell years and so forth. And I think the second big piece was having the new Wasserman Football Center on campus and really kind of having state-of-the-art facilities. And that's kind of a signal to recruits, to parents, uh, to you know assistant coaches that, hey, UCLA is going to be more serious about football moving forward. So hopefully there's a turning of the corner with that. Hopefully there's a turning of the corner is right. And Jamal, I just want to shout you out for a quick second. When you said they were sponsored by Jordan Brand, the greatest athlete in team sports history. I'm a Jordan guy. I love LeBron. He's fantastic. He's a fun player to watch. But Michael will always be the GOAT for me. So I'm happy you shouted that out like that. Um, But also you brought up some valid points. I mean, when you look at the football complex – where these guys are training the offseason. I mean, the famous Brady video where he's throwing it into the jug machine. That's at UCLA. You know, Russell Wilson's there. Odell Beckham's there. You know, it, the cream of the crop NFL talent is now flocking to Westwood to train during the summers. To have a center like that, it's priceless. And when you get a guy like Chip Kelly, who has had so much national success, I mean, when he's running that Oregon offense, you know, close to a decade ago, That was as good as an offense as you'll ever see in the Pac-12, probably since the Bush liner teams at USC. So to get a guy like that on campus is huge. Granted, he has not even come close to coming up with those expectations since he's been there. But it's kind of a now or never situation. Um, We've talked all offseason long about how this team has the talent to, you know, win eight or nine games coming into this year. All five offensive linemen return. You have a four-year starter in Dorian Thompson-Robinson. You got a great backfield, Britton Brown and Zach Charbonnet, the transfer from Michigan there. Greg Dulcich, um, I don't know if you watch these Herbie Awards, Kirk Herbsbreed named, you know, maybe the top three players that are being undervalued around the country. Dulcich was his number one choice on that, the tight end from UCLA. And if you go and watch the USC film, I mean, he's probably the best player in the field that night. He was outstanding as a tight end for UCLA in the past game. The offense is going to be there for the Bruins. I don't think they have anything to worry about that. Um, But kind of give me your assessment on how good this team could be on offense, because I think the sky is the limit. Chip Kelly's kind of got his pieces where he wants them, and he's now going to go let them play. 
Well, I think you nailed it on the head. And if you if you really look at this season, you know, you know, last season in many ways was obviously an anomaly with COVID. And everyone talks about the importance of year three for a new coaching regime. And and this is really Chip's year three uh, in, in many ways in terms of his full season where he's got his guys and he's got his philosophy in place. And it's so interesting that you mentioned those great Oregon teams. And he's very much got this team in that impression and in that mold. You know, those great Oregon teams, whether it was Darren Thomas or Marcus Mariota, they had the two-headed monster with LaMichael James and Kenyon Barner. And then they had a great tight end in Ed Dixon. And so when you talk about DTR, when you talk about the charbonnet Britton brown combo, and then you talk about Dolchich, those are exact, that's the exact same formula that he had at Oregon. You know, many people you know, failed to sort of realize that even when he was putting up half a hundred year after year at Oregon, it really wasn't through the wide receiver. Oregon didn't really have a five-star blue chip kind of NFL guy at wide receiver. And, and it's sort of funny to think about when they were lighting up the scoreboard. It was really sort of run first, run with the quarterback, and then get the tight end involved with the RPOs. And that's what he's got going here in, with exactly those pieces. And so that combined with the experience, the key for me offensively is going to be how can DTR manage the, the inevitable bad play. And I think what, what has sort of happened with DTR in, in the first three years of his career is one bad play becomes two, becomes five, and all of a sudden a good game can get derailed. So how can he kind of stay on schedule and kind of shake off a bad throw, shake off a bad read? and just continue to stick with the process. He's got so much talent that I think for him, it's a, it's a matter of being able to read the game of when do I need to be game manager and when do I really need to let my athleticism speak for itself. And I think hopefully the continuity with the offense is going to get him to realize that year four starter, such a rarity in college football, I think he's really ready to make that next leap. I think you're totally spot on. Uh, it was always a question more of, Boy, if this guy figures it out at the QB position, uh, the rest of the Pac-12 is going to be in trouble because this guy, like you said, has all the talent in the world. And we've seen little steps, incremental improvements year after year. For instance, last year was the first year he completed over 60% of his passes. You know, we saw a little bit of him be a little bit more dynamic in the run game. The play that stands out in my mind is that long touchdown run he had against Colorado in the first few weeks of the season. I think it was like a 60-yard QB choice to the outside. Beautiful play. Um, you know, and we lost four games last year by a combined 15 points. So we were in these games. I mean, for any Bruins fan, the UCLA SC game was probably maddening because they had the lead. They get a kickoff return back to like the 50 yard line. And then USC kicks a 50, like a game winning field goal to win it. So it's it just frustrating. And it, most of the losses went that way. Um, kind of give me some like stat expectations for where you think Dorian Thompson Robinson could be at the end of the year. And do you think there's a chance he could be first team all pack 12 uh, when all is said and done at the quarterback position? Well, I think that uh, I think for, for DTR, I think the, the, the next step in his progression is I think completion percentage. I, I think he's going to be in that 62, 63% uh, in, in kind of the completion percentage game. I think Chip is going to really sort of, protect him a little bit in terms of some of the lateral passes, some of those easier throws, uh, some of those shorter balls to Dolchich and Kyle Phillips. I think certainly 3,000 plus yards is, is in the cards. And I think he's going to challenge for a year of, of, of 25 touchdowns or more. I think that's kind of where he's sitting. I think the key for me is going to be, is that inter interception number under 10? Uh, because, you know, I think he's going to get the numbers, the question is going to be, you know, how can he sort of limit those mistakes? And, you know, you mentioned obviously the four losses. When you look at the USC game, that was a game that, that UCLA really dominated for two and a half to three quarters. Uh, you know, there was a couple of mistakes there on some short yardage situations that really sort of snowballed. Then there was sort of that pick um, that he had with uh, Hufanga, you know, down the sideline. And then when you look at kind of the Stanford game, I mean, they sort of had that game locked up. And again, it was kind of a short yardage mistake that sort of opened the door for Stanford to, to, to go down and force overtime and ultimately go into double overtime. So for, for me, the key for, for DTR is going to be limiting those mistakes. And I think if he's at uh, 10 or under interceptions, I think that's going to be a real recipe for success for UCLA 
along with a, a completion percentage up north of 63 percent. I think those are all great predictions, and uh, we're going to have to check these out at the end of the year because we want to go back and check them out for our own two cents. Um, I, the one thing is we've mentioned the Chip Kelly run game was dominant, and returning five linemen, including Sean Ryan, who – you know, maybe the class of the Pac-12 when it comes to left tackles out there. Alec Anderson is a future pro at right tackle as well. So you have the bookend tackles there. You have the two running backs we talked about earlier. We got DTR is going to take some balls himself and just scramble down the field. Uh, give me your opinion. When the season concludes, do you think this can be a team – that has a top 10 rushing offense in the entire nation. Cause I actually do. When you have a coach like Chip Kelly and you have all those pieces coming back, I think just in general, if you have a good offensive line at the pro level, high school, college, whatever it may be, you're going to have a chance to be in some football games. I think the line is one of the strengths of this team. I will. I think that's, that's a great point. I think top 10 would certainly be something very aspirational uh, for them to get to, but certainly within the realm of possibility, no question about it. I think, you know, they're, they're, they'll certainly be in the top 20, I would say. And I think for me, more than more than personnel, I think the personnel is there uh, at the QB position, the running back position, the O-line. To me, it's more about tempo. And I think where UCLA got in a little bit of trouble last year, truthfully, was Chip was all, had his foot on the gas every step of the way on, on every play. And I think while that worked at Oregon, I think Chip has to sort of incorporate a little bit more of Sean McVay in, in his oh. sort of packages when you're talking about the UCLA run game. I think sometimes UCLA sort of outran themselves, outran holes and blocks and spacing opportunities, especially in key short yardage situations, if you look back. And I think his hurry up tempo sometimes was very detrimental from a game management standpoint. So I think schematically, spot on um, that they they have all the makings to have a a great season. I think the key between a top 20 rushing season and a top 10 is actually going to be the way Chip manages tempo. I love it, man. And it'd be nice to see some motion wide receivers coming across the field as McVay loves to use. Um, Britton Brown, this guy averaged almost seven yards a carry last year. This is a very good veteran back to have. And he had Charbonnet from Michigan who, you know, was the, Cowbell ball carrier for Michigan, his freshman year on campus, five-star recruit coming out of Oaks Christian down there in the Los Angeles area. Kind of fell out of favor with Josh Gaddis as he was more in kind of speed and space type of guy. Charbonnet's more of a bruiser for his size, I'd say. But, you know, I talked to Mike Regalado, who's the 24-7 sports guy for UCLA and the, the Bruin Report, and he told me Charbonnet looked as good as advertised in spring ball. What do you make of these two backs? You know, it's interesting, Will, you know, when uh, Dimitri Felton, who, you know, had such a sensational year last year as, as UCLA's primary back, you know, when he decided to not play the Stanford game for, you know, getting ready for, for the NFL and we put Brown in there, you know, we didn't miss a beat at all. I mean, Brown was, was north of, of 170 in that game, was hitting his holes. He's a smooth runner. He's, he reminds me a little bit of Chris Marquis with a little bit more sort of wiggle uh, to his game. And Charbonnet is definitely sort of a bruiser. No question about it. He likes that contact. I think that's why he picked Michigan and wanted more of that Big Ten style. But he is deceptively fast. He's got a motor on him. And, and the legs, uh, they move quickly. He's got very quick feet. Um, and so, you know, I think he's got a little bit of of Le'Veon Bell to him a little bit, to be honest with you, in terms of that quick feet in the hole. And I think UCLA fans are going to see a little bit of that uh, from Charbonnet. He's sort of deceptively fast. He's going to surprise some folks down the sideline as well. And so uh, very bullish on both those guys. And and that's going to be the bread and butter uh, of of this UCLA team. Couldn't agree more. I think the offense, you know, if Dorian Thompson Robinson could be as good as we think he can be this year, I don't think it's going to be a lot of uh, like, many problems coming from the O the defense is the question. Um, you do have a little bit of improvement with Jerry as squad on the defensive side of the ball. Caleb Johnson had five and a half sacks in seven or eight games last year. Very impressive stuff from him. A good day showed some flashes. Quinn Lake's going to be healthy this year. Hopefully he can play more than five games. He's only done that once in his career. Love what I'm seeing from Quantrez Knights. Um, you know, just a lot of stars returning on defense, 
But we did see that at least a tangible improvement from Mazzanero last year. I think if they can get in the top, you know, 50 to 60 defenses with how good that offense can be, I don't think it'll be that problematic. Do you think that's a fair statement? Well, absolutely. And again, I think once again, the, the defense is sort of modeling a little bit of Chip's persona defensively. You know, he's always historically loved a little bit more undersized guys uh, at the D-line position, but who are quicker. And, and his sort of physical enforcers have always been on the back end in the secondary. And when you look at Quantrez Knight and when you look at Quentin Lake and you look at Kirkwood, those guys love to get after it. And those guys are physical guys, uh, both in terms of press coverage as, as well as sort of uh, back in when they're in different coverages in diamond and nickel and so forth. And so uh, I think it's going to be really exciting to see them on the back end. The one uh, challenge with those guys is they take a lot of chances back in the secondary. And so part of the challenge with this defense is that they're very big play prone uh, to sort of giving up the big play. And I think if they can kind of stay disciplined um, and, and really the goal, I think, for uh, the defense is number of plays. And I think the, the more plays in, in sort of a weird sense, the more plays they can be on the field, I think it's going to be better for UCLA because they're not giving up the big plays on the back end. And I think hopefully this year, I think it's going to be a little bit more of a simplified model. I think there was a lot going on schematically the last couple of years, uh, a lot of confusion you could see in different spaces. And I think a streamlined, simplified approach um, to just sort of attack, uh, attack the defenses in certain areas, uh, I think is going to be really key and, and let your players be physical, uh, but not be reckless. Last question I'll touch on for the defense. Uh, do you think this team does achieve its ceiling of being, you know, in the 50s and 60s on uh, defensive numbers? I think so. Uh, and I think that's going to be uh, a product of both, uh, I think, their simplified playbook. And I think it's also going to be a little bit of a product of you've seen quite a bit of turnover in the Pac-12 uh, on the offensive side of the ball and a lot of question marks at quarterback. And I think that's going to sort of help this group a little bit and maybe even camouflage some of the challenges that they may have uh, because even though the schedule is very difficult, when you go sort of on a quarter a quarterback by quarterback basis, there's still a lot of questions um, with, with some of the teams that they're playing. And so I think, I think kind of mid-60s is probably where this team is going to end up defensively. I love it. Well, we do have a game this weekend, uh, Hawaii traveling to the Rose Bowl in Los Angeles to take on your UCLA Bruins. Just good to have football back in general, Jamal. It's going to be a nice time out there. Um, you know, this is a game that the Bruins can't take lightly because they got LSU the following week. And, you know, this is a team that has not won an out-of-conference game with Chip Kelly as their coach, which is a crazy stat to even throw out there. Um this is a familiar foe to Chip Kelly. Todd Graham, the head coach of Hawaii, coached at Arizona State for many years while Chip Kelly was dominating the Pac-12 North with Oregon. So they do know each other pretty well. There's a lot of talent there, too. I mean, you know, 18 starters returning for the Rainbow Warriors. This is not a team you can take lightly. They've got a quarterback who's, you know, relatively dual threat, Shaven Cordero. He threw for over 2,000 yards last year, 14 touchdowns, ran for seven and close to 500 yards on the ground. Um, you know, this is a team that the Bruins are going to have to come out and smack in the mouth early. Um, but I do think this is a very winnable game. What are your thoughts on uh, the opening game for UCLA on Saturday? Well, absolutely. I think, I think this is a really good first game for UCLA. Um, I think that, you know, Hawaii comes in with, again, a lot of experience and – a lot of juice. And I think one of the things that's kind of been a, a challenge for UCLA in, in the recent past, kind of the Fresno States, the San Diego States, you know, you got a lot of teams who, who come in rather experienced. They've got this game circled. It's a lot of players that maybe got passed by UCLA in recruiting. It's a, it's a lot of guys who are relatively close from a geographic standpoint. who are kind of either coming back home or near home and they've got a chip on their shoulder. And, you know, UCLA has sort of struggled a little bit to put teams away early. And then, you know, things sort of snowball when you kind of get into the second half of games and it's a close game. Uh, and then you give you give your team, uh, you know, an underdog, a lot of confidence moving forward. And then, you know, the shorter the game gets, the more challenging it can be in terms of precision and execution uh, for UCLA. So I, I think that this is going to be a competitive game 
for a half to two and a half quarters. And then I think you're going to see UCLA pull away uh, and win by, you know, two touchdowns, 14 to 17 points. But I think you're going to have a competitive first half of a game. Um, I think UCLA is still going to be kind of finding themselves exactly what they want to do. Hawaii is going to come in charged up. And I think Graham knows uh, Chip style very well. You know, he won a Pac-12 South title at Arizona State, gave Oregon fits while he was there. Um, and so I think he, he knows kind of what to expect, but I think the talent discrepancy will ultimately take over in the second half. Awesome. Well, I got some quick over-unders for you before we go down the conference schedule uh, for UCLA, see if we got any winners, just some predictions there. Um, over-under, Dorian, Dorian Thompson Robinson throws for over 200 yards on Saturday. Over. Over. Love it. Uh, he's going to rush for over 70 yards, over-under. I'm going to go under there, Will. I think I think Charbonnet and Brown are going to going to do the lion's share. Well, you knew me too well. I'm going with those guys. The next question, one of those guys, in my opinion, is going to get over 100 yards. You can go either over 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 under uh, for Charbonnet or Brown for over 100 yards. Are you going with the veteran and Brown or the youngster Charbonnet? I'm going to go with I'm going to go with Brown for the first game, and I think that you know, given that he's the more experienced guy, I, I think he's going to get some more touches to start. Uh, but I think Charbonnet is definitely going to make his mark on this game. Last one I got for you, Greg Dulcich. Um, we're going to go 80 yards, but here's a caveat and a touchdown. So I guess over under a half touchdown plus 80 yards in the receiving game. That's an interesting one. I think uh, I'm going to go under on that. I think that there, I think the team's going to get into the red zone quite a bit, and then it's going to be maybe a keeper or two into the end zone for DTR or given to one of the, the backs to sort of bring it in. So I think I'm going to go under on the, on the half touchdown with Dolchich. I love it. Well, by the way, what was your final score? You have them winning by two touchdowns. I'll, sh- I'll share mine uh, after I get yours. So, you know, I got them in kind of the, the 14 to 17 uh, range there. Uh, I kind of like them 37-17 on, on Saturday. I love that. I went 42-20. I went the run game is going to be dominant. And we're going to get some Greg Dulcich touchdowns. That was kind of my prediction for the game. So not too far off between the two of us, man. Here is the schedule for the season for the Bruins. I'm just going to read off the schedule games, and you're just going to go win.